for who they are. Turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 4, and our comments will be taken out of verses 10 through 20. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, now that at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have you ever walked into a room and you've, there's some friends of old or relatives you haven't seen for a long time and they look at you and they say, well, look at you. You look like good old uncle so-and-so or you look like your dad or you look like your mom. Have you ever had that happen? No? Oh, okay. That that's indeed has happened. And you go take a look in the mirror and you say to yourself, I don't see what they see. Maybe I'll look again. But what's more important is that we live in a time when the philosophical mindset says that we are basically a blank piece of clay, a blank tablet, so to speak. And that we are free to create who we are, to create who we look like philosophically or psychologically. Now, if that's the case, could you give a description of what a Christian is? What would be the image of a Christian? Now, I don't need to have you talk all at once. It just is... Hmm... Let's have a closing word of prayer. It's not that it's discouraging or anything like that. I know, you, I know that you know, but you're just a little bit too shy. Kind. Beg your pardon? An honest, loving, kind, integrity. Okay, an honest, loving, kind person filled with integrity. All right, that's a pretty decent profile. Does that fill the whole thing? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Oh, you looked at it right off of my screen. Well, that, that part of it is true, that actually, you could look at it this way. Which would you rather have? If you were serving the Lord in some position and you had to have a team around you, what if you had the most gifted person in the world to help you out? Is that great? That's good. That works well, doesn't it? But this most gifted person in all the world is also the most unreliable person in the world. Is that good? So would you be happier to have somebody who's a little less gifted but competent enough to do the job, but the faithfulness factor uh, ranks very high? Would you like to have that instead? Yes. Okay. Now we, now we can have a word of prayer because you've, you've gotten to the core of the message right there. Because we're speaking on the importance of faithfulness and... When we speak of faithfulness, a lot of times we're speaking of faithfulness in serving the Lord, and that is a primary factor. 
But notice that when we are people of faith, we're also supposed to keep faith with one another. If we can't keep faith with one another, whom we've seen, how can we keep faith with one whom we have not seen? And to put it another way, how can we actually say that we are keeping faith with our Lord and Savior if we are not keeping faith with the brothers and sisters, if we're not keeping faith with the body of Christ? And so it seems to me that faithfulness may be that one characteristic that glues all of these other characteristics together. If not, it sure ranks high on the list. The Philippian believers provide an example of what it means to keep faith with one another. We want, they display the nature of faithfulness and they display the value of faithfulness. So let's look first of all at the nature of faithfulness. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Notice their faithfulness is logged in in their history of relationship with Paul. In days gone by, when Paul was in need, they were there. They were faithfulness in helping, they were faithful in helping him so far as his circumstances in life are concerned. And notice that in the 10th verse that they are presently supporting. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. They supported in the past. Now when the need is there and they have the opportunity and they have the awareness, they are presently supporting him in his ministry and particularly in the difficulty of his ministry. Keep in mind now, where is Paul at this time? He, that's right. He is, he is under house arrest. And we ought to take a look at uh, Roman history on this point. When you're under house arrest, that basically beats the dungeon. But on the other hand, when you're under house arrest, you have to pay for your own food, you have to pay for the guard, you have to pay for everything that's re that keeps you under house arrest. I was thinking about that today and I thought, I wonder what they would do to the person if he defaulted. And I thought about that for a while and I figured, well, maybe the dungeon would be about the next thing. So I, I would think that perhaps, uh, uh, <clears throat> well, I'll not go there. I don't want to make this uh, too political, but it seems to me if they're gonna put a, a bracelet around somebody's ankle and let him stay at the house, then maybe he should uh, pick up the rest of the tab as well. But notice there is a consistency here, and that is a part of the notion of faithfulness. And their faithfulness is basically in character. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. We'll cut back to this verse uh, once again. But notice here, it is a matter of Christian fellowship. Nevertheless, you have done well to share. Underscore the word share, because sometimes it is translated, particularly uh, when it is uh, used as a noun, uh, it is translated as fellowship. That the support of the brother or the sister in need is an expression of fellowship. We oftentimes speak of fellowship when we gather around the table or just when we're together and having a good time. And some people say that's not fellowship. I would still like to suggest that that is an expression of fellowship if the reason for us being together is our common commitment to Jesus Christ. And in this particular gathering, we have the opportunity to encourage one another in our Christian walk. I still would call that fellowship. At least I would say that that is the circumstance in which fellowship can occur. I know that I've met some people along the way. In fact, I've even met them here too, that fellowship can take place if and only if you're having a Bible study, a prayer meeting, or a heavy discussion about the faith. I don't think that's true. And it seems to me that when we take a look at Romans, uh, I think uh, chapter 12, what is one of my favorite verses that come out of there? If you don't know it now, you're going to be called before the elders this coming month. We'll give you a hint. Rejoice 
with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That is a practical application and understanding of what fellowship is. What? It's Romans 12, 14. Thank you for that. <laughs> Since I couldn't think of it. <laughs> okay, so that notice that their faithfulness, it's, it's a matter of, of character too, because they share with him. Notice in the time of laughter, Notice, in his affliction. And that, of course, was a time when if you stepped out and maybe identified yourself with a brother or a sister in the faith, you were putting yourself oftentimes, if not always, in harm's way. And notice that it is a matter of concern, too. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. That there is somewhat of an affection, that there is somewhat of an attachment for the brothers and the sisters in the faith, and that, con that attachment oftentimes will show itself in terms of concern. How many times do we gather here at church, and how many times in other churches or in other places where Christians are, um, the question is asked, how are you doing? Did you ask that question tonight? At least three people are nodding their heads, more than that. Now, did anybody ask you how you were doing? Now, one of two things. That question was asked on autopilot and they really didn't care, or that question is one that is regularly asked by people who do care. And that is just the practical application of concern. But notice that concern, when it is consistently there, is the expression of faithfulness. That is faithfulness at work. And it is at work in matters large and matters small. And again, we go back to verse 14. You have done well to share with me in my affliction. That the sharing itself is the expression of concern. And it is a matter of consistency as well. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. It is the matter of consistency. When we take a look at the past, where he was concerned, or when they were concerned for him, when we take a look at the present and they show a concern, there is a line of consistency that comes along through and maintains the relationship. And this is what the Christian walk has always been about. And this is what the Christian walk is about today. And it will continue to be that way until we are with the Lord. So it is indeed a matter of concern and it is a matter of consistency. Look again at verse 15. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. The term giving and receiving is actually the term used by accountants at the time. It speaks of opening up the ledger and seeing uh, how things are going on accounts receivable and accounts payable. The, this notion shows up again in verse 17. So you yourselves know that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. The Bible says it's more blessed to give than receive, but wherever there's going to be a giver, there's got to be a receiver, right? And you see that here, that the, the relationship, and that's what I want to draw out, the relationship of concern and faithfulness is being applied through this accounting term, that there is indeed a consistent uh, expression of concern and that consistency is the expression of faithfulness. And not only that, it's a matter of generosity. Notice here, but I have received everything in full and have an abundance. 
I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Notice here, I have received everything in full, and having received it, the net result for me is I now have an abundance. Now, here is a hobby horse that I haven't pulled out of the corral for a long time. Have you ever heard somebody say, and I know none of you would have ever said it in the context that I have in mind, underscore in the context. Have you ever heard somebody say, we have to be good stewards of the Lord's money? And what does that really mean in the context that I have in mind? That they're nothing but scrooges and pinch pennies and they're going to sit on it and the ministry has to languish. I would much rather make a mistake in favor of grace, would much rather make a mistake in favor of an abundance than to sit tight on something that we can't keep anyhow. And especially if it's in support of the ministry. Now, there are times, and I admit it up front, there are times when that is an appropriate statement that perhaps somebody's ready to go overboard on something that is really secondary or of no consequence at all. In that instance, it is true that we should be good stewards of the Lord's money. But there's been plenty of times in the ministry, not just mine, but any number of pastors and other leaders where being a good steward of the Lord's money just basically means don't want this to happen, going to sit on it, and I want you to do the same. And that is just not right. Notice that their faithfulness also has effect that goes just beyond the financial relief. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked the opportunity. Notice I rejoiced. That when you showed, when you brought, or when Epaphroditus brought this gift, it prompted a sense of joy. And I rejoiced in the Lord. And I didn't rejoice hanging on to my joy in a pinch penny way to be a good steward of God's joy. Notice that in your fullness, in your greatness, you brought about a great sense of joy to me. Notice the revival of your concern had this consequence, it had this result, that it brought about joy. Then, notice as well, it brought, it met Paul's needs and it reduces the burden of Paul's affliction. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me on my affliction. And, well, I'll touch this verse one more time, and then I'll bring it out there. But what I want us to see presently is that we are called upon to share one another's burdens, are we not? Is not the scriptures rather plain on that? And now we can see exactly uh, what has happened. It has brought him great joy. And in this instance, you've done well to share with me, and we've already pointed out the, the matter of fellowship here. And it reminds us of chapter 3 that we were in sometime this year, some time ago this year, that this is a practical application of being a part of the fellowship of his sufferings. That when we have a brother or a sister that's suffering, and we step in to do what we can to alleviate the suffering, we are a part of the fellowship of suffering. And that's what faithfulness is all about. And notice that what they have done in this support is it enables Paul to pursue, pursue his ministry. But I've received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Notice here, as something to the side in terms of the development of my outline, notice that here is also 
In this expression of faithfulness and concern and support, notice it is also worship. This gift from Epaphroditus is a fragrant aroma. It is an acceptable sacrifice. And it is well-pleasing to God. Notice those last two clauses, the acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Notice how this language rings of Romans 12, 1 and 2. That we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And part of that expression is that we give from the fruits of our labor. And it was a fragrant aroma. And in the end, we would say it was, it was undoubtedly a fragrant aroma in the presence of God. It was an acceptable sacrifice in the presence of God. And therefore, it is well-pleasing to God. Sometimes I think that we in church life basically make a distinction between worship and giving. But giving is an act of worship. And Paul is, I mean, the writer to the book of Hebrews is pretty clear on that. That there is the sacrifice, the fruits of our hands, the fruits of our lips. And all of this is a matter of worship. And it enabled Paul to pursue his ministry. When he is amply supplied, the notion is that he is amply supplied to carry on in the ministry as best he can under house arrest. So this is the nature of faithfulness. Let's take a look at the value of faithfulness. Not the value just to ourselves, but the value in the body of Christ. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. Now we point to the term, you have done well. The term well itself is an adverb. And oftentimes, more times than not, it is used in a moral category. But oftentimes, even when it is used in a moral category, the term can be translated beautifully. You have done beautifully. That there is, at least in the thinking of, <clears throat> of old, that there is a beauty to morality. That there is a beauty to doing things that are morally right. And rather than saying beauty, I chose the term noble because it seemed to fit at least in the way that I'm thinking. But it does speak of something that is good. And in the ancient mind, even in the Greco-Roman mind of Paul's time, that there was still, in the thinking of some, a beauty in doing that which is morally correct. And remember back in, I guess, the 60s and beyond, here you have some hippie running around, and he's probably in another world. But all of a sudden, you say, hey, man, that's beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? And you take a look and you say, it looks pretty ugly to me. But in his smoky view, it was beautiful. They had plugged in to some of somebody somewhere uh, had been alert enough in classical studies to pick up what some of the ancients used in terms of an understanding of that which is moral. It was a noble act. It was morally beautiful. It was good. Uh, it had an elegance to it. It is morally elegant. And that elegance survives on the foundation of faithfulness. And notice we referred to it this morning. And here's where we see the standard for elegance, beauty, and nobility. As John closes out his third epistle, he speaks of the visiting evangelists or missionaries. And he says, brothers, beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. All parties to this illustration have since gone on to be with the Lord. But one time we had a missionary speaker and we had a love offering. It was on a Sunday night. 
and the speaker himself only wanted airfare. And so we said, we'll do airfare, but we take up a love offering. And he said, that'll be fine. He had some of his own followers from this area, and the attendance was really pretty good. We did the love offering, and uh, the bookkeeper came and said, uh, what do you want to do with the offering? Well, that was code word that if the offering is really super low, I'll pull something out of the speaker's fund just to make it respectable so that we don't look like a bunch of pinch pennies when in fact we are not. And so I said, how much is it? And I was told that it was $1,100. And I said, we said a love offering? Um, give it. Because that was the agreement. A few weeks later, when the, uh, when the uh, financial accounts were made public, I had somebody jump on me at the door. It was really on my case. And uh, he said, that was too much. I said, it might be too much to you, but we had the same thing as a verbal agreement on my, as far as I'm concerned. I said, we were going to do a love offering and that, you were going, that he was going to get it. And I, and I said, I'm not going to change it even though it was okay with him. And he, I, I finally said something like, we don't muzzle the ox who treads the corn. And he said, you fed the ox too much corn and stomped out the door. I would much rather make a mistake in favor of grace than I would stinginess. And in this instance, as far as I'm concerned, there was at least a quasi-legal agreement. It was a verbal agreement between the two of us whether it rose to the standards of a verbal contract, I don't know, but I looked at it that way. And I have this in mind. You are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish, notice, for the brethren. And these were the ones who were coming through. They were the itinerants. You are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren. And notice, especially when they are strangers. There's no nepotism here. There's no favoritism here. There's, uh, well, I guess that would cover it all from some of the complaints that you hear from time to time. These people are perfect strangers. They have no contact uh, or no strings attached to the congregation except for the fact that they were all a part of the body of Christ. And you are doing well, especially when they are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. And in light of what you have done, you continue to do so. You will do well to send them on their way, notice, in a manner worthy of God. Every time we do a love offering, the question that the congregation should ask itself how much should I pull out of my billfold to make it a, in a manner worthy of God? And this I find particularly true, and I think at least the chairwoman of the missions committee will say a hearty amen, and some of the other missions committee people too. It's much more difficult for missionaries to receive support in the United States than it's ever been. And as whatever this church may have in terms of faults, one of them is not being stingy with their missionaries. And I don't know what the final count is, but the love offering this morning was really pretty good for a congregation this size, and I commend you. And I think you did what you were supposed to do according to 3 John, verses 5 and 6. It is indeed a noble act, and nobility for you and for me is that which accurately reflects the nature of God's love, his grace, and his mercy. It is an act of generosity. We've already seen that. It's a, an act of worship. So I'll not spend a whole lot of time on that, but we'll move on. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Notice that what Paul was saying, I'm under house arrest. I can't even really work. You've supplied my need. God has supplied my need through you. And he will supply your need through others. And it is indeed an act of personal value. 
that there was a personal interest here. And notice that it was not only horizontal between believers, but it was also vertical between believers and the Lord, the Lord and the believers. And so it will be in the future too. Here's that term again, account. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. That as you serve the Lord, the whole, the whole implication is that we all have to stand before the Lord and give an account of what we do with our lives and what we do with the things that God has given to us, not only to enjoy richly, but remember that Paul points out in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that the enjoyment comes in the sharing. And so this is an act of personal value for the present as well as for the future. Paul says, I do not seek the gift itself as though I am some craven leader, but I seek it for the profit which increases to your account. That same account that opens the books to see the giving and the receiving. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. As Christ keeps faith with us, and that's what this verse is about, we need to keep faith with him. And when we keep faith with Christ, we are keeping faith with one another. Can you think of a situation where we can be unfaithful to the brothers and to the sisters and honestly say that we are keeping faith with Jesus Christ? If he is the head and you and I are a part of the body, there's no way that you're going to honor the head and dishonor the body. And so, for they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. Notice, support them in a manner worthy of God but they went out for the sake of the name, the name of Jesus Christ. And they accepted nothing from the Gentiles, from the unbelieving nations. Notice, therefore, we ought, underscore that term ought. It's the verb of moral imperative. If we are going to act nobly, if we're going to act beautifully, elegantly in the moral category, we have the moral oblig obligation to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. Notice that our commitment to support, say, somebody uh, like Mike and Linda, as we did today, we are fellow workers with them. Whatever they do in the name of Christ, we're doing it with them in some de remote way. And so as we keep faith with each other, Let's always remember to keep faith with those who have gone out for the sake of the name, that our fellowship must expand and go well beyond friends and family who are part of the body of Christ. This is what faithfulness is. Faithfulness is the commitment that is consistently in operation and in use in our lives. One of my favorite verses, of course, is 1 Corinthians 4.2. It is required of servants that they be found faithful. And he goes on to say, it makes a little difference what you think of me. And as long as we're faithful to Christ, it makes a little difference what people think of us. And in the end, there is where our freedom is. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we ask your grace and we thank you for it that you who have begun this good work in us will remain faithful to us until you perfect it at the day of Jesus Christ. And we ask our Father that you will cause us to renew our commitment regularly to show our faithfulness to you by being faithful to one another. In Christ's name we pray and ask these things. Amen.